What's going on guys? I'm your host Aaron Lloyd and this is episode 49 of the Creation Grounds. Before I get into our next creative inspiring guest, I want to encourage you, yes you, to like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, your family, everybody about this podcast that you think will be inspired, educated, motivated, and all of that. My next guest is a Chicago-born poet, writer, actress, playwright. She does it all, just creative individual And in this episode, we talk about her writing process. Before we get into that, I want to let you know a little bit about her. So as an actress, she's worked with people like Dominique Morisot on her show Pipeline. She's been on NBC. She's a season three writer for The Shy on Showtime. She's been featured on uh, the Goodman stage, Goodman Theater stage, and much, much more. She's currently working on a project that you should stay tuned for because it's a very good, exciting project. And in this episode, we talk about her rewrite process. We talk about how she approaches her work, how she focuses, how she gets over a writer's block, and she gives advice to up and coming writers and actors and creatives in general who are kind of navigating the industry right now during the pandemic. You're gonna enjoy this episode very much, as much as I'm sure you're gonna enjoy Nami. Enjoy this episode, let's get to it. Welcome to another episode of The Creation Grounds. I have a very talented Nami Kelly on with me. She's an actress, a writer. What's up, Nami? Hey, how you doing, Aaron? How you doing? Didn't you just book something? I did, yeah. I just uh, booked a bull. Yeah. It's so Congratulations. It's awesome. Thank you. Thanks. So, yeah. So let's, um. For, so writing is really a great skill of yours, and you're also talented and, and um, acting, but writing is something that you kind of veer to. If if any author or playwright could pen your life, who would you want to do it and why? Oh my, who would I want to pen my life? Um, I think you know the, when you asked me that question, the first thing that popped into my head was Dr. Maya Angelou, um, just because there's the the savviness of the poetry of her and the way she hears life and witnesses life and records life. Um, and she did write plays. She wrote a few plays. So I would say um, someone who was past uh, ancestral, Dr. Angelo, absolutely. And as far as somebody who's living, who could pin my life? Oh my goodness. That's a fascinating question. I would say, <laughs> there's a, um, an artist in Chicago whose name is Shepsu Eaku. And he's like a brother to me. And he's uh, written thousands of plays and now he's writing for TV. And I would say I would say that he probably would do the best job because he probably knows me better than any other writer I could think of. And he's known me the longest. So he would be able to write about my life from, from many decades of experience <laughs> of witnessing me fumbling through this. Sh- can I curse? Yeah, you can speak your mind. Fumbling through this shit you know <laughs> he'd be like yeah, I remember little teenage Nambi sitting at the train station at DePaul he used to steal theater that's how I met him he was a artistic director of a theater company in Chicago that I met at DePaul I went to DePaul but they would um, roam the halls of DePaul and they would steal classrooms and they would rehearse plays and then they would produce them and so that's how I met <laughs> And that's how I got my first production, actually. That's funny. By any means <laughs> necessary, stealing, get it done. By any means, they were stealing theater. <laughs> what's your What's your earliest memory of um of writing or a piece of art or um performance that you knew was for you? Like what What sparked it for you? What's your earliest memory of that? Oh my goodness! Um, my earliest memory of um writing and performing something I wrote actually was probably in second grade. And um, I went to uh, a school that no longer exists on the south side of Chicago called um, Doolittle West. And it was right in the middle of um, Ida B. Wells' housing projects, like it was called a nestle in the middle of there. And it was a very, very uh, difficult environment. That's how I'll put it. But um, I don't know. I don't know when I discovered words. Like, I couldn't tell you when that happened. But for some reason, I was like, I'm going to write a poem about spring. And I wrote this poem about spring. And then I got up on stage and performed it. And like, I'm super shy. So like the whole notion of me at like seven or eight years old, getting up on a, getting up and doing like a a poem that I wrote. And you know, and it was one of those things, 
like I never told my mother I was doing this. So I went to school and, you know, I didn't, you know, my hair was, you know, not combed and I wasn't dressed right. And some little girl, let me tell you this, some little girl got up. And she had like the little Shirley Temple curls, uh-huh. like her hair was all pressed and like she had on like some fluffy dress and she got up and read some poem. I'll never forget this. I was so embarrassed, you know, because everybody was like, oh, because she had straight hair, you know, her hair was pressed and curly and she and I, I wouldn't look in the part. And um, and I, I never forgot that, you know, like and I didn't win. Like she won the contest. My shit was better. I believe. <laughs> But she won the contest, and I just remember being so uh, deflated and flabbergasted, you know. And and I wasn't the kind of person that, like, that sort of stuff fueled me. Like, ooh, ooh, I'm going to get it next time. I was just kind of like, woo. I was like, like, shriveled up. It was like, oh, little eight-year-old me. You know, that's the first time I remember it. And it wasn't a successful memory. That's dope. I didn't know you yeah. were shy. That hasn't been my experience of you anytime I've I've met you. Are you still currently shy? Or are you, you? I'm very shy, you know. But it's it's like the the performing. You know, like you get on stage and you come alive. And so, like I I, I think that when I walk through my life, um, I absolutely like. Oh, I'm super shy, but I know how to be be present in a room right. you know and then like and then i go home and i'm just like oh my god that was exhausting <laughs> oh my god i'm sweating under my armpits oh my god my heart is racing oh my god my palms are itchy oh god yeah i'm really shy gotta recharge i feel that what's mm-hmm. your what's your research process for playwriting where do you start uh that's a good question i think it depends on the work uh because i i think because I have so much experience on stage for so many years that a lot of the ways I approach writing is how I approach developing a character as an actor. So I let the actor, as an actor, pardon me, I let the character sort of tell me how they want to be laid into me physically. You know, do you want me to read? Do you want me to experience? Do you want me to go watch a movie? Like, how do you want me to, how do you want to fill into me? And I do the same thing as a, as a writer. Like, I just kind of let the work tell me what it wants to be and how it wants to lay. So in terms of research, um, I I usually try to start with, as an actor and and as a writer, the personal, like what's the most, what's the personal connection with this work? And and then allow that to sort of fuel and how it sort of pops out of me. So, and I watch a lot of videos and like all that kind of stuff. It just depends on the, project when you're faced with writer's block what what questions do you ask yourself to kind of get out of that what do you do especially if you're faced with like deadlines Uh that's a good question um hmm. i would say when i get faced with writer's block usually it's a it's a it's a question of ego like there's somewhere in the process or in where i am in the process that my ego is in the way and that I need to check it, you know, um, because like acting, it's an act of surrender. Writing is surrender for me. And when I'm trying to control it is when I get blocked. And to control to me is absolutely about my ego. My ego is in the way of the work. And so I have to check myself. And so sometimes what I do in order to break that is I get off Facebook and I might go for a walk or I go for a run or I get on my knees and I pray or I meditate or I go hug my cat or I go laugh with Daniel. Like I, I do something to sort of break up the monotony of the meanness of what we do as artists mm-hmm. and, and try to focus, refocus my thought on the big picture of why I'm here, which is um, is much larger than me, you know? I love that. And when I when I get stuck on that is when I'm like, oh, I can't write. Yeah, it's because you're thinking about you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like acting. Like you got to focus on the other. Yeah. It's about what you're affecting, what you're trying to do. It's not about you. You know, and so that act of surrender, you know, is hard. Yeah, I love that. Uh, what play, character, or TV script has given you the most joy to write, and why? Uh, the play or TV script that's given me the most joy. I would say um, 
I was really blessed several years ago to um, to go to Singapore to work with artists in Singapore. Um, this was crazy because I, w- I, w- I went to La Mama, went to Valletto with them um, and worked with Lynn Nottage and I was there for, I guess we were there for like three weeks. Um, and from and when I was there, I met some artists there from Singapore and another artist from Italy and the artistic director who was from Singapore, he said, he, he emailed me, well, this was crazy. I had a dream that he had called me and said, hey, Nambi, would you like to come work with, with me? And then the next day he called me, wow. which was crazy. The next day I got a message from him and he said, hey, I'm putting together this, this international project. Would you like to go? Would you like to be part of it? And I'm like, well, do you got the money? Is this going to pay my rent this month? Because, <laughs> you know, that's real. You got to pay your rent. And so um, he was like, well, you know, we have an application out to the um, Singaporean government. And I was like, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Sure, I'm in. And a month later, he called me, and the project was a go. And I got to spend uh, two years um, intermittently working with artists in Singapore and Italy on an adaptation of a book called The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And we uh, made a play, and we traveled to China, and we traveled to Tibet, and we studied with a monk wow. for, th- for three weeks. Um, and, and it was really cool because it was what I love, which is international collaboration. I mean, being able to see beyond, like, the facade of, of difference, you know, but actually, like, coming together to talk about life and death, which is what we all experience, and, and to talk about it cross-culturally and to find the commonality. And I remember, um, and so they brought me, um, I wound up being in Singapore, in and out of Singapore for the, that time period, but I would spend like a month there, we would go back for six weeks, and it did, and we did it at the Singapore Arts Festival, and it did so well that they brought us back the following summer, and then I got to perform it again, um, and it was really beautiful. Um, we, we created the birth of the universe on stage with like lights and sound. Like the most extraordinary artists, the finger players in Singapore, Chong Zichen, who's who's in charge over there, most brilliant, gifted, visionary artists. And I always feel like that project in particular, like it, it combined everything that I really care about, you know, which is, you know, let's get past all of the malarkey of you know, your skin is this color, your gender is that. And let's really like talk about what it is to be alive, you know, regardless of where you live in the world. And it, it really was a beautiful collaboration. It was difficult, you know, and you, you run into a lot of, um, you know, uh, people have ideas about what it is that you black and from Chicago. So that means you got a gun, <laughs> you know, like we came into that in rehearsal. And, and I was like, um, no, or like, well, you black, so you must like rap music. I said, actually, I like the Beatles. That's <laughs> you know? right. It's like, it's like not even be able to like, you know, to, but, but being able to do it in a space of love, not mm-hmm. antagonism. It's just extraordinary. It's an extraordinary moment in my life. Um, and I'm very grateful I had the experience. That's awesome. And that just kudos to you from being from like Chicago and making your way to Singapore. That's that's incredible like you know from the the eight-year-old poet to to singapore that's awesome um thank you uh what what does your writing ability impact your work as an actress and vice versa i think i heard that it kind of does because you you surrender yourself to the work um do you want to how or how not besides the surrendering how does how do they inform each other i'll tell you that um they used to war with each other and um and i had to learn uh that the source of them the reason why i do what i do is because for me like it's how i serve god right that's that's literally how i think of my art and so um and so but I was like, well, I'm this, I'm this actress, and I'm doing it this way. Oh, but I'm this writer. I'm this actress. I'm this writer. And I went to grad school to study mythology because I, I, I did this low residency program in Vermont, 
where uh, where I could work um, everywhere and wherever I wanted to work, and I would go to school two weeks of the year, and then I got a master's. And it was great because I really could design my own curriculum. And, and, and so my degree was in interdisciplinary studies. And so, and I designed the, my program. And so what I learned was that these things aren't at war with each other. They're the same source because it's, it's, it's being that of a servant, right? And, and, it, and, and so I, I, even sometimes now, like, I'm like, oh, I'm so busy. I'm writing. I, you know, I have to tell my, my manager, oh, I can't audition right now. Oh, blah, 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 blah. or I get, a, I get this voiceover audition before you. And I was like, ah, shit, I don't have time to do this. But I'm an actress. I'm an actress, right? And I'll be, you're still an actress. Do it. You know, but ultimately, like, I've learned that they come from the same place. And uh, and they have the same intentionality, and because they do, um, they always inform each other. Like playing with my cat informs it. Going for a walk informs it. Watching the rats try to navigate the snow today, hilarious. <laughs> All of that informs it. And Daniel always jokes with me. He's like, he's like, you don't waste nothing, because like we'll be talking about something randomly, and then like two weeks later, it'll end up in a play. <laughs> That's funny. So he got to be careful. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, he's a hoot. <laughs> what advice would you give maybe somebody in Chicago who's listening, either in high school or they're just about to graduate college? They're smart, they're driven, um, they're about to enter the real world of what it is to act to serve work and all this kind of stuff and be an artist what what advice would you give that person uh the advice i would give that person is to take advantage of this pandemic moment you know there's all of these um amazing programs and even today like that csa thing it didn't happen yeah but it was supposed to like i was trying to log on you know what i mean like i want to see what's happening you know and so like opportunities like that that you know, when we were coming out, and I'm a, probably a lot older than you, like like that stuff wasn't like you had to really hunt to find that those sorts of opportunities. And now it's like you can't not be online and not see that. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of that is because of my circle. But also, if you look for, it, you don't have to get on a plane to go find it. You could just do 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 type type type, and it's all there. So take advantage of. You know, these that casting director thing that happened today. Like, keep your eyes open. Is so and so in this meeting? Get in that Zoom. You know, because I mean, we could sit and we could wallow and we could say, "Oh, poor me, we're not doing theater," or we could get up and be like, "But what can we do? Let's mm-hmm. yes and this. We're artists, right? Yeah. Let's yes and this shit and 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 do that thing that we're called to do, which is to create art." Um, and to make those sorts of connections with people, I think it's an opportune moment for that. And, um, and it's easier to do than to have to be in a room. Um, that being said, I do understand that it's, I don't mean to minimize, I think it's an incredibly difficult moment for our industry in a lot of ways, but I think, you know, spirit, universe, God always gives us exactly what we can use. And so it's up to us to figure out how to use it. Mm-hmm. And so, so many young people, like, because Daniel and I have been doing some residencies mm-hmm. in colleges and with a lot of young people that are just getting out. And oh my God, the world is so scary. And I'm not going to lie, I can't even imagine yeah. <laughs> what that must be like. And if I was not already established, like, how difficult this moment must be. But you just got to just got to trust if it's because it'll it'll happen you just got to trust it and you got to keep moving towards it um doors will open you know they will they have to yeah what is your rewriting process like um how does how do you look at a script with fresh eyes and inspiration mm-hmm. uh sometimes my rewrite process it's very kinesthetic in the sense that it's going to depend on the work, how it ends up getting rewritten. Um, and it's a full body experience. So sometimes I dream about work or if, especially cause I'm working on a lot of work with ancestors, like, like Richard Wright used to come be in my dreams, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and it always informs my rewrites because I have it, it deepens my connection to the work. And so then I'll go back into the work. And then 
uh, I just I just start at the top and I start going through it. Um, and because sometimes a lot of times what I'm learning about myself is that um, I overwrite. And so I'll say because I, I'm a poet and so I'll say things like it five different ways in the same phrase and the scene's not really moving forward, but it's very pretty mm-hmm. <laughs> the way I've said this same thing five different ways. And so it's really like, hmm. Okay, delete, 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 save, right? Um, also with my rewrite, sometimes I, I, I prefer to work with a dramaturg. Um, so I love uh, like having another person that like read my work. Sometimes that's Daniel. And <laughs> they'll read stuff and they'll ask me questions or give me feedback. And, and I really love, um, and so then that gives me fresh eyes to then go in and do revisions like sort of blows up my brain about what I was thinking about something. Um, and also sometimes I will just, sometimes even if it's too early, sometimes I'll do a reading of a play uh, because I'm an actor and it's, it's a kinesthetic thing for me. Like I can get inside words and I feel the performativeness of it. And mm-hmm. so it's like, I, then I can figure out, Oh, I see. Yep. Just cut that, cut that, move that, do that, do that. And when I watch actors grapple with stuff, it teaches me so much about the work. Um, um, it used to be difficult because I'd be so in the acting, like I get distracted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd be like, it's on the page. Where is the actor <laughs> in the room? The, it's an exclamation point. What are you doing, right? I would get all judgmental. But now um, that I'm a seasoned woman, not seasoned woman, but an older artist, not older artist, but I'm more mature, period, in my life, that I've learned to sort of separate that and listen for what I need to listen for. And I also um, am learning that questions from audiences will teach you so much about what's working or not working in the play so sometimes I will like my biggest pet peeve is when a dramaturg will say to you or a producer will be like this part here I'd love more of that I always want to say if you want more of that then bitch you write it (laughs) (laughs) then you write it because that doesn't help me tell the story I want to tell by you telling me what you want more of. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's a very subtle thing that you have to check people and you have to do it very gently. And so I have a very structured way that I receive uh, notes from people. And sometimes people are like, I don't understand. It's like, but you don't need to understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just need to help me get to a place where I can do my work without me getting you know, stuck because I'm thinking about what you want more of. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so, but to me, like, the sort of acrobatics of being inside another person's brain and and getting them to give you something. Um, When I was in college, I took a, a, I went to undergrad at DePaul, and I took a a criticism class with a gentleman named Tony Adler. And he was, like, one of the biggest critics in Chicago at that time for a publication called The Reader. And sometimes, um, and we would always do this exercise, and I love this exercise because every every beginning of every class, he'd bring an object, and he'd put the object in the center of the room. It's a small room. It's like 10 people in the class. And he, and, he, and he would challenge us every week to describe the object without attachment, right? And it was very diff- it's a very difficult thing to do. Like, people always project themselves onto uh, your art. Mm. And and it's like, you can do that once I've completed it. Like, I want you to have that sort of connection once you, once I've, once I've built the thing, but, um, but it's very difficult to like discern like that, that whole thing of consider the source. Mm -hmm. Like I'll go, cause 'cause when when I take notes, like I write down everything. If I'm in a session, I write down everything and I'm, it's kinesthetic, right? So I have to write it. I can't like just hear it or type it like, or even though that's kinesthetic, like I have to do, 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 I have to handwrite it Mm -hmm. and I get my handwritten notes. And literally, I will go back through and, and and I leave them for like a week or two or longer because I want to forget who said what. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because sometimes you'll be like, oh, but that person, they had an attitude at the door. Or they fell asleep <laughs> on the reading, so they missed that whole part. So, like, I really try to get rid of the people in my brain who said what and then 
and be like, oh, that's useful. Oh, that's not. And I'll literally just circle stuff and scratch out stuff. And actually, I have a sheet right over here because I just did a note session with, um, what's his face? Craig Williams. Mm-hmm. So I have all of these notes. And it's the same process. It's like it's all the stuff that circled because he gave me such great dramaturgy. Yeah. Um, I'm circling all my notes, but then the stuff at the top. So the stuff at the top is stuff I've implemented. Mm-hmm. So, so this isn't quite a good example. Oh, but here it is. Like right here. Like he gave me that note. And I was like, eh, I don't really need that. <laughs> um, and I and so I, what, I did type these out because we were going super fast. Um, but normally I just handwrite. Um. So there's a lot of different ways I do rewrites. And, and, but one of the things that I always try to do is, um, is, to, is to make the dialogue, because I overwrite, so to really like slender it down to what's exactly the action. And, and I also sometimes challenge myself. I say, what happens if in this scene there's no line that is more than five words? Wow. Now, now, mind you, like this is after I've done the emotional work of it, mm-hmm. but it's like, how can I, how can I make this scene clip by, and no, no sentence longer than five words, and and it's amazing what you'll find. It's like, oh, I don't need all of that. That's fat. Boom. You know. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm very curious about this. I asked all my guests this: when you think of the word creative, who comes to mind for you, and why? Oh, this is crazy. Okay, the first thing that I thought of was Daniel. Mm-hmm. He's just the first person that popped into my head, and 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 I and I and, and the why of that is because like he's such an artist, and it's really uh, beautiful to watch. You know, like he's a person that he's um, he's like you said, he's really humble, and and he he is also driven. You know, not because he's trying to promote himself, but he's driven by by a love of people, and 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 particularly like certain particular populations of people where he feels like that their work matters. Mm-hmm. And so, what what's beautiful is in this Zoom time, like we don't we have a two bedroom, two bath duplex, but we need a third room because. I need an office, right? So I'm actually in the living room <laughs> with my little partition, but he has a nook office and then he has our bedroom as his office. And so what's beautiful is when he's in the zone and listening to him uh, just be so present with people and giving his whole heart. It's just, it's like, that's art. And that's the most creative thing and the most vulnerable thing you can do. And it's and that exchange, like it's more than it means so much more than TV and Broadway and, and all of this. It's just like that's the reason, like to impact to to impact people with your heart and your humanity. And he does that so beautifully. And to me, that's an act of creation. Like he's literally planting seeds of beauty and joy and sunshine across the world like he did this residency i feel like he's working at hb studios or something and this class there were people in the class young people in the class from all over the planet like different countries and they would like he was meeting on like sunday at some crazy time and like watching the joy in his eyes when he talks about them discovering you know this simple activity that he's done a million times it's just it's it's just something so beautiful about that um, the way he approaches his art. I love that. And, yeah. yeah. I guess I'm missing him in this quarantine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's gonna be two weeks, right? Um, hopefully not. Yeah. But yeah. How can people contact you? I know you have a website. I'll put that in, in the show notes. How do you have Instagram, Facebook? You have any uh, social? How can people follow the uh, the the project that you're currently creating and um, find out more about you? Um, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and uh, what's the other one? Twitter. I don't have a lot of Twitter. Um, but, but yeah, you can find me all those places and it's Nambi E Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y and I should pop up and I'm happy to, um, 
you know, be in touch. Beautiful. Nami Kelly, pleasure talking to you. And I hope you uh, book that VO, VO gig that you just did. What? Well, you know, it either is or it ain't. I know. Let's surrender to it, right? <laughs> That's all you Let's can do. Surrender. The beauty is you just, like, I literally, I do, I rip up sides when I walk out of a room. Yeah. I just, I'm done. I live the life. And that's the joy space for us as artists because you may never book a job, right? So my approach, I walk in and I'm living the life of this character for me. And if you're on board with that, cool. But if you're not, I'm still good, you know? That's beautiful. Thank you. Dope.